There was a statement some time ago by a big national leader who had said that Hindus and the Muslims have the same DNA and it did not get much of an attention on the secular side from the left-leaning people but from the nationalistic side or the people who so-called right-wing there was a lot of uh, reluctant criticism of this statement that the Hindus and Muslims have the same DNA, they are the same people so perhaps all the enmity, all the differences should be forgotten Similarly, many Muslim leaders, especially those with political interests, often give these token statements, Hindu, Muslim, bye bye, we're all the same people, etc, etc. But when you look at the reality, when you look at all the videos that are going viral on social media, and there are so many of them, or even when you look at the statements made by the Bangladeshi or the Pakistani Muslims, the reality at times seems a bit different than what our leaders and what the mainstream media and the Bollywood would have us believe. Because on one hand, they say that we are the same people, the leaders, that is. They say we are the same people. But then the same Muslims, the people from the same Muslim community say that remove the police for 15 minutes and see what we'll do to you. Or they say that we're going to break down the Ram Mandir. Or they sing the praises of those barbaric invaders who killed so many lakhs and lakhs of Hindus. There seems to be a big conflict between what the secular and Muslim leaders say and what the common Muslim things. And of course, I'm in no way saying that all the Muslims think the same way. Absolutely not. There are plenty of moderate Muslims. But then again, the question rises, do moderate Muslims even count? Does their vote, do their thoughts, do their actions, if any at all, do they even count for anything? But well, that is a discussion for another day. But what is it that separates the Muslims from the Hindus? What is that one dividing factor? This has been explained very well by Sri Sitaram Goyal in his book Muslim Separatism Causes and Consequences and I would like to read an excerpt from the book for you here so that you get a better understanding of this because the Muslims in India are by and large the same people as the Hindus except for a microscopic minority which takes pride in its descent from foreign forefathers the Muslims in India share a lot with the Hindus in such externalia as race, language, dress, mores and manners what is it then which divides the Muslims from the Hindus and sets them as a people apart? A correct answer to this question will go a long way in putting the problem in its proper perspective. The answer is obvious as well as inescapable, unless we fall victim to the Marxist metaphysics, according to which the Hindus are the haves and the Muslims are the have-nots. And the conflict between the two is a disguised form of class conflict. But there should be no doubt that it is Islam which divides the Muslims from the Hindus. Hindus would have to understand Islam if they want to understand Muslim separatism. There are certain conclusions which cannot be avoided if you study the corpus of Islam from its original sources, which is the Quran, the Hadith, and the biographies of the Prophet, and the compendia from the four leading schools of Islamic law. Number one. The Kalma or the Confession of Faith in Islam proclaims that there is no God except Allah and that Muhammad is the only Prophet of Allah, the last Prophet of Allah, which means that all Hindu gods and goddesses are non-existent or false and that all Hindu sages and saints, rishis and munis, whether born before or after Muhammad was made the Prophet by Allah, are impostors or have been superseded. Number two, Allah says, that the Qur'an is the last as well as the best revelation which has superseded all earlier revelations of divine truth and ruled out any future revelation till the end of time. Which means that all Hindu guides to spiritual seeking, all the Shrutis, have become null and void and that Hindus who continue to look up to them are no more than misguided fools. Number three, Allah also says that he has perfected the code of human conduct in the lifestyle of the Prophet, that is the Sunnah, both for becoming virtuous in this life and for entering paradise hereafter, which means that all the Hindu codes of conduct, the Dharmshastras, have become invalid and can lead only to vice in this life and hell in the afterlife. And neither do the Hindus have a right to evolve any code of conduct in the future, which is why perhaps they have a problem with the UCC. Number four, the Qur'an as well as the Sunnah informs us that the age preceding the Prophethood of Muhammad, that is the age of ignorance or the Jahiliya, 
and that all cultural creations of that age have either to be so converted as to fit into the framework of Islamic culture or destroyed root and branch, which means that the entire culture which Hindus have inherited from their glorious past has either to be forced into Islamic molds or to be wiped out altogether. Number five, Islam assures us that Allah has bestowed the whole world together with all its wealth and population upon his chosen people, that is the congregation of Muhammad, and that the lives, properties and honor of the infidels, the kafirs, stands forfeited in favor of the believers, that is the moments, which means that Hindus have become squatters in their ancestral homeland, and that Muslims have an unalienable right to drive them away, kill them, plunder them, enslave them, and dishonor them in every way till they agree to be converted to the only true faith. In short, Islam divides the human family into two factions, the believers and the infidels. It divides human history into two periods, the age of ignorance and the age of enlightenment, and the inhabited earth into two camps, the land of believers and the land of infidels, Darul Islam and Darul Harb. And it postulates a permanent war between these divisions. The believers are called upon to wage an unceasing war, that is the jihad, on the infidels, till the latter are converted or killed off. The age of enlightenment should strive in the same way till everything belonging to the age of ignorance is remolded or replaced. And the Darul Islam should continue to send missions to the Darul Harb till the latter is conquered and converted into a Darul Islam. As you can see in the migration that is happening to the West from Islamic country. And this is not just theory, this is not just some text like Manusmati who nobody follows. This is followed in practice by a vast majority of Muslims across the world. And you just have to look at the behavior of the invaders who invaded our country to see how true they have been to their religious scriptures. Because wave after wave of Muslims from Islamized lands abroad had poured into India for several centuries in the wake of Islamic invasions. They were the sportsmen, the missionaries, and the minions of Islamic imperialism. Most of them had forced Hindu women into matrimony or concubinage and fathered a prolific progeny on them. Some of them had also taken to Hindu moors and manners to a certain extent, particularly in matters of song and dance and other modes of entertainment. But in spite of everything, they had remained a foreign fraternity in forcible occupation of land which did not belong to them except by right of conquest, and which they never loved as their motherland. They had continued to despise and lord over not only their Hindu subjects, but also the native converts, whom they had forced or lured into the fold of Islam. In fact, their contempt for the native converts was deeper than that for the Hindu subjects. They had all along looked down upon the native converts as Ajlaf and Arjal, as compared to the Ashraf, the distinctive designation that they had reserved for themselves. Muslim rule in India was never a process of continuous expansion and consolidation. It broke down again and again and was re-established every time by a fresh wave of Islamic invaders from abroad. But it fell down finally and completely in the first half of the 18th century and could not be salvaged even by the invasions of Ahmad Shah Abdali, uh, whom the Ashraf had invited for putting down forces of national resurgence. Almost all parts of the country which had once been under Muslim rule passed under the sway of this or that Hindu power. The provincial Muslim dynasties like those at Lucknow and Hyderabad could save themselves from extinction only by entering into a subordinate alliance with the rising power of British imperialism. It was the power of British bayonets and not its own intrinsic strength which had preserved the privileged position of an alien Muslim minority in several parts of the country. The Vijayanagar Empire had effectively prevented the percolation of a privileged Muslim class in large parts of South India. The Rajputs had never permitted this class to plant itself in Rajasthan, Bundelkhand and Bagelkhand. Later, the Marathas had taken care of this class in Maharashtra, Gujarat, Central India and Orissa. The Sikhs had done the same in the Punjab, Kashmir and the Northwest Frontier province. The Jats had taken care of it around its imperial seats at Agra and Delhi. Assam had all along remained out of its reach it would have met the same fate in UP Bihar Bengal and the territories ruled by the Nizam, but for the British intervention, which gave it a new lease of life. It was in these provinces 
that the residues of Islamic imperialism regroup themselves for a renewed bid not only for retaining their unjust privileges, but also for restoring Muslim power in the rest of India in course of time. Pakistan and Bangladesh are their fixed deposits. Those are Islamic states. No one else can lay a claim on them. India is a joint account. Plunder it as much as you please. This is how Sri Shiv Prasad Roy, a very perceptive Bengali writer, has summed up the present situation in what is described as the Indian subcontinent nowadays and what has been known as Bharat Varsh since time immemorial. Sri Roy could have easily extended the logic and concluded that Afghanistan was another fixed deposit created by the Muslims quite some time before Pakistan and Bangladesh came into existence. Afghanistan too has been an Islamic state since its inception. But Sri Roy is not the only Hindu to have missed that point. Hindu society as a whole has ceased to remember that Afghanistan rose on the remains of Gandhar and Kamboj, the two ancient Janpadas of Bharat Varsh, which had stood guard on our northwestern gateways for ages untold. Nor would Hindu society like to remember that Balochistan, northwest frontier province, Sindh, West Punjab, East Bengal and Silhet were constituent units of the motherland less than 100 years ago. Hindu society would fain forget the partition in 1947 if the Islamic crusaders inside the residue that is Hindustan did not continue to remind it that partition was by no means a closed chapter. Because Pakistan is not the final demand. It's just the most recent demand. There is plenty of evidence to show that the Muslim behaviour pattern has remained true to type in the years after 1947. We have witnessed an increasing incidence of street riots staged by the same sort of Muslim hooligans on the same sort of petty pretexts as in the years preceding partition. Muslim spokesmen, no matter what political platform they use, have leveled the same sort of accusations, namely that the Muslims are a poor and prosecuted minority entirely at mercy of a brute Hindu majority, that Muslim lives, properties and honour are not safe in the midst of a rising tide of Hindu communism, and that the Hindu chauvinism is seeking to wipe out all vestiges of Muslim religion and culture. It is the Pirpur report of the Muslim League all over again. Next comes the constant complaint that the Muslim community has had hardly any share in the national cake, particularly in the fruits of economic development that has taken place in the years after independence. We are told that Hindu business houses do not give jobs to deserving Muslims, that Hindu bureaucrats discriminate against Muslims in public sector undertakings and state-sponsored welfare projects, and that Hindu-dominated educational institutions deny every opportunity to the Muslims to improve their qualifications. We are also informed that Hindu vested interests conspire with Hindu hooligans, Hindu police and Hindu militiamen to destroy Muslim properties and Muslim business establishments wherever and whenever the Muslims start getting prosperous by their own unaided enterprise. These accusations and complaints have been followed by concrete demands which also remind us of the pre-partition days. The general demand is that Muslims should have not only reservations proportionate to their population, but also weightages in all sectors and at all levels of national life, particularly the national administration, including the armed forces. Some years ago, a Muslim spokesman had demanded that 20% seats in the parliament and the state assemblies should be reserved for members of his community. He also recommended that the remaining 80% seats should be filled only by those persons whose selection before elections had been cleared by the same community. And finally, the Muslim spokesmen have threatened that if their complaints are not heeded and their demands have not been met, the Muslim masses will be forced to launch a struggle for securing justice for themselves. As this Muslim behavior pattern unfolds further, a demand for separate electorates is bound to be the next logical as well as psychological step. The downtrodden Muslim masses will discover before long that they cannot expect a vigorous vocalization of their grievances from representatives elected by a mixed population, even when some of these representatives happen to come from their own community. In due course, pressure will be mounted for constituting Muslim-majority districts, divisions and regions wherever the Muslims have a sizable population. These Muslim-majority areas will clamor for becoming autonomous units like the Kashmir Valley so that the Muslims can decide their own destiny. 
and these autonomous units will wait for an opportune time to federate with Pakistan or Bangladesh under the protection of this or that world power, depending upon the configuration of the world forces at that time. Meanwhile, Muslim majorities can be manipulated in many more districts by mass conversions of the weaker sections of Hindu society with the help of petrodollars, by mass infiltration from Bangladesh and Pakistan, and by mass breeding in pursuance of divine commands conveyed in the Quran and the Hadiths. The contours of this campaign can be seen by all those who have not become blinded by secularist slogans or have not been denationalized by a vote-hungry politics. There is also plenty of evidence to show that the national behavior pattern with regards to the Muslim minority, so-called minority, has also remained true to type in the years after independence. The national leadership is once again responding to this sinister situation in the same sloganized manner as had been stereotyped by its predecessors in the years preceding the partition. This leadership has once again failed to see the long-term strategy at the back of short-term tactics. The scene is once again being dominated by politicians who live from hand to mouth, who cannot see beyond their nose, who run a rat race for winning applause from the Muslims, whose eyes are galvanized greedily on the Muslim vote bank, and who take the Hindu society for granted. There are several straws in the wind that is blowing in different parts of the country, Urdu's being recognized as an official language in state after state, even though Urdu teachers in schools and colleges have to sit idle for want of students. Academies are being set up in many state capitals in the name of Iqbal, an ardent advocate of Islamic imperialism. Kerala has given a lead in carving out Muslim-majority districts, leaving the local Hindu population at the mercy of mullahs and Muslim hooligans. Assam is the most poignant pointer to the way towards which things are heading. In the past, the Islamic imperialists who invaded India had to equip and bring along their own armies. But in the case of Assam, the same invader has been assured by the government of India that he need not bother to bring along his own battalions and that all ammunition and manpower he needs will be supplied to him in India itself, free of cost and in ample measure. It is a different story that the patriots in Assam have fought back fiercely, though with bare hands, to meet and many a time repel the rapacious marauder. The government of India or its part has left no stone unturned to aid and abet the aggressor. And what makes it all worse now is that we have no warning voices. In the years preceding partition, we had Sri Aurobindo, Swami Shraddhanand, Lala Lajpatrai, Bipin Chandrapal, Sarat Chandra Chatterjee, Veer Savarkar and Dr. Hedgevar, who had studied and seen through Islam and who had sounded an alarm. Even Rabindranath Tagore had expressed his misgivings after exchanging notes with some mullahs and Muslim politicians. It is a different matter that the voices had been drowned by the sermons which Gandhi poured out in praise of the noble faith of Islam. What remains significant in that old story is that these thinkers and writers had done their duty by their people. We hardly hear such voices of sanity in our present-day predicament. What we have instead is a large number of self-righteous or self-seeking politicians, hand in glove with scholars and scribes, who have never done their homework in Islamic theology or Islamic history or Islamic theory of the state, and whose stock in trade is finding faults with the prostrate Hindu society. What we have are leaders who want to convince the Hindu society that we all have the same DNA, that you, the Hindus, have nothing to fear. Islam came to India as a fully developed ideology of an aggressive and self-righteous imperialism. It tormented Hindu society for several centuries. Hindu society had meanwhile deceived itself into believing that Islam was just another religion and therefore entitled to reverence. Islam became an ardent and active accomplice of British imperialism against which Hindu society had to wage yet another struggle. It made the struggle much more difficult than it would have been otherwise and coerced the national leadership to do all sorts of political and constitutional acrobatics. Finally, when Hindu society succeeding in winning its freedom again, it forced a partition of the Hindu homeland with the help of a foreign power. Hindu society had to pay this price because it had again deceived itself into believing that Islam could also inspire patriotism and that the votaries of this creed also deserved an honorable accommodation. Islam has established its theocratic states on both sides 
of the truncated homeland which Hindu society has been able to retain for itself. It has driven away millions of Hindus from their ancestral homes and has been harassing in a most harrowing manner millions of other Hindus who have been unable to escape from its bigotry. It is once again out to decimate Hindu society so that it may acquire a majority and restore its lost empire. Hindus should have done some hard thinking about Islam and its invariably vicious behavior which Hindu society has witnessed for so long and at such a great cost to itself. But that is exactly the habit which Hindu society seems to have lost. The habit of hard thinking. For quite some time now, Hindu society has been substituting some soft and soothing slogans in place of hard and creative thought. What is worse is that even the slogans it raises are seldom its own. It simply borrows them from wherever they are available in an alluring and facile form. One such slogan has been that the British sowed the seeds of discord between Hindus and Muslims and brought about the partition of the country before they left. The Hindus and the Muslims were living happily for so many centuries, which of course is not true, but that's what we are told. It was the British that brought the divide that divided the Hindus and the Muslims, which led to the partition. Except the British have left, but the relations between Hindus and Muslims are no better, if not worse than they were during the British rule. This should have been sufficient proof that the British were only exploiting the differences that had already existed between Hindus and Muslims and that the British had not created those differences. Separatism was the stock in trade of Muslim leadership. The British only made use of it for their own purposes. So should the Hindu society keep on believing the slogans of our leaders? Should we say that, yes, we have the same DNA, so forget about everything else. Let's just live in this supposed communal harmony. Because there is a certain dharmic revivalism going on, and it is giving a lot of problems to a lot of people, even many of the Hindus, especially in the wake of the Ram Mandir being built. But Hindu revivalism in the 19th century and today is essentially a resurgence of the national spirit of a people who were native to the land and who had suffered terribly and for a long time from successive foreign invasions. Hindu society is aspiring to reform and renew itself in the image of its ancient ideals, which had endowed it with strength and stability and kept it immune from alien inroads. In the process, Hindu society had an inalienable right to pronounce its own judgments on imported ideologies which had coerced and corrupted it. On the other hand, Muslim revivalism is the frenzied reaction of a foreign fraternity which had finally failed to convert a majority of the native population to its own creed and which was therefore feeling terribly frustrated. The die-hard descendants of Muslim swordsmen and Sufis were now reviving dreams of an empire which their forefathers had built with so much bloodshed but which had been lost in the last round. They were calling upon their confused comrades and converted victims to revert to those medieval ways when Islam had molded the pagan and peace-loving people of Arabia into a brotherhood of bandits. In the process, they were fast becoming the inmates of a lunatic asylum crowded with some of the most desperate characters. The history of Arab and Turkish aggressions against India would have been no different from the history of earlier aggressions by the Greeks, the Shaks, the Kushans and the Huns, but for the presence of a new factor. A culturally superior and temperamentally compassionate Hindu society would have tamed these latter-day barbarians as well and turned them into civilized members of its own household. What made the big difference and complicated matters was that the Arabs and the Turks had themselves become victims of the vicious ideology of Islam and lost their own cultural identity before they came to this country. And this mentality is pervasive not just in the uneducated or the radicalized Muslim society, it is also prevalent in the educated Muslim circles. And I'll give you an example from the book The Meaning of Pakistan written by F.K. Khan Durrani in which he says, and I quote, There is not an inch of the soil of India which our forefathers did not once purchase with blood. We cannot be false to the blood of our forefathers. India, the whole of it, is therefore our heritage and it must be reconquered for Islam. Expansion in the spiritual sense is an inherent necessity of our faith and implies no hatred or enmity towards the Hindus. Rather the reverse, our ultimate ideal should be the unification of India, spiritually and politically under the banner of Islam. 
the final salvation of India is not otherwise possible. And the same way of thinking has been prevalent for quite some time now, as is evident from the speech of R. M. Sayani, which was delivered in 1896 at the 12th session of the Indian National Congress in Allahabad. Yes, as you hear this speech, remember that this was delivered at a Congress session. Sayani says, Before the advent of the British in India, the Muslims were the rulers of the country. The Muslims, therefore, had all the advantages of pertaining to it as a ruling class. The sovereigns and the chiefs were their co-religionists, and so were the great landlords and great officials. The court language was their own. Every place of trust and responsibility, or carrying influence in high emoluments, was by birthright theirs. The Hindus did occupy some positions, but the Hindus were tenants at the will of the Muslims. The Hindus stood in awe of them. Enjoyment and influence and all good things of the world were theirs. By a stroke of misfortune, the Muslims had to abdicate their position and descend to the level of their Hindu fellow countrymen. Descend to the level of their Hindu fellow countrymen. The Hindus from a subservient state came into land, offices and other worldly advantages of their former masters. The Muslims would have nothing to do with anything in which they might have to come into contact with the Hindus. This was the way the leaders of Muslim society thought about things towards the end of the 19th century. This is what they thought of a hundred years ago and at the time of the partition. And from many of the statements that the Muslim politicians make nowadays, it does appear that the situation hasn't changed much. When somebody tells you that remove the police for 15 minutes and you see what we can do to the majority, it is a clear indication that this thinking still prevails. So once again, the question to the Hindu leadership you can tell us that we have the same DNA and that, that we can live in harmony, but does the Hindu society not have a right to defend itself from yet another genocide, yet another partition? Because right now, as things seem, it does quite apparent and has been highlighted by many current Hindu thinkers that it does uncannily seem that today is a lot like a hundred years ago. So before I end this episode of the podcast, I want to leave the question to you, the listener. Should the Hindus just keep on going as they are, living in some sort of a supposed harmony with the community that wants to subdue them, that wants to fly the flag of Islam once again all over the Indian subcontinent? Or should the Hindus start thinking? And I'll end this episode with an excerpt from the book The Tragic Story of Partition by H.V. Sheshadri, in which he writes, For 800 years, Hindustan waged a relentless freedom struggle, probably the most stirring saga of crusade for national freedom witnessed anywhere on the face of this earth. From Mahanana Kumba to Maharana Pratap and Raj Singh in Rajasthan, from Hakka and Bukka to Krishna Dev Rai in the south, from Chhatrapati Shivaji to the Peshwas in Maharashtra, from the various Mata Gurus of the six, including Guru Govind Singh to Banda Bairagi and Ranjit Singh in Punjab, from Chhatrasal in Bundelkhand to Lachit Burfakan in Assam. Countless captains of war of independence piloted the ship of freedom and steered her through perilous tides and tempests. As a result of their ceaseless and crushing blows, the conquering sword of Islam lay in dust, shattered to pieces. This was a rather controversial topic of discussion, but I felt that it had to be discussed because I get a lot of messages about this and about what's happening not just in India but across the world. And uh, I think we'd be fools to ignore history and we'd be fools if we did not study the ideology of the people who mean us harm. Once again, the excerpts used in this episode are from three books. Muslim Separatism, Causes and Consequences by Sri Sitaram Goyal, The Tragic Story of Partition by Sri H. V. Seshadri and The Meaning of Pakistan by F. K. Khan Durrani. You can follow me on the social medias. The name is the same, Indologia, I-N-D-O-L-O-G-I-A. I'm on all the major social platforms. Please send me your feedback. Tell me what you like, what you don't like. And if you have any suggestions or ideas, do not hesitate to send them to me. Till the next time I see you, Jai Hind, Vande Mataram.